the afternoon session. I'm John Coates, delighted to be able to introduce and moderate um, a very distinguished panel of colleagues and friends from Harvard and elsewhere. Um, Harvard gets the call out because we have the majority of speakers here, but we have people from Yale and Chicago and BYU. Mark Rowe will lead us off here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, ben Iverson from BYU will follow. Ed Morrison from Columbia. David Skeel from Penn. Luigi Zingales from Chicago uh, School of Business. And Alan Schwartz from Yale will round out the panel. Let me remind everybody that there's time limits. We're all doing this sequentially around the world, so 15 minutes each for the panelists. Um, and I'll send you a little chat reminder if uh, you seem to have forgotten. Then we'll have two discussants from Harvard Business School, Adi Sundaram um, and Kristen Mugford. I think Kristen's on. Hopefully Adi will join shortly. Uh, and then we'll have possibly, depending on people's um, remembering the time limits, a few minutes at the end for Q&A. And the topic overall uh, uh, is the impact. It's a US-centric topic to some degree because it's focused on the bankruptcy process, which is, of course, a, a fairly um, specific US institution relative to other countries. But it's also got a broader focus um, uh, with some emphasis on corporate financial distress uh, more generally. And uh, Luigi is going to also talk about the CARES Act as part of his remarks. Um, I think I have two minutes left to say something substantive, uh, which is about all I had time for this week. So um, I much appreciate the invite to be able to say something very brief. Um, one maybe obvious point to kick this off, but just to make make the point, um, you can conceive of, of the virus as a giant shock uh, transmitting downwards um, the likely fulcrum security in a typical capital structure that involves debt for large companies. Um, that has the implication that the conflicts that are um, in, in the background often between creditors and shareholders will become more acute um, as high investment grade firms become low investment, low investment grade firms become junk and junk becomes very marginally solvent at all. So we can expect there to be, regardless of the bankruptcy impact, just more conflict uh, as a result of the virus. Uh, in any corporation that has significant debt in its structure. Um, in addition, um, let me say a word about fiduciary duty law here, which I don't think will be the main focus of the panel, but I think relevant to, to take into account. Um, at least in Delaware, the principal U.S. jurisdiction, um, individual creditors really never can directly assert fiduciary duty claims. However, once a company becomes insolvent, uh, the duties, as lawyers typically articulate them, uh, of directors and officers do run to the creditors as well as to the company and to some extent still the shareholders, depending on how insolvent the company is. And that as a result, uh, Delaware case law holds that uh, creditors can bring derivative actions um, against directors of insolvent companies for breaches. Um, having said that, uh, the notion of a zone of insolvency is not really a legal thing anymore. Uh, and directors continue to enjoy business judgment rule protection, demand requirement protection, uh, even if the company is insolvent. And so as a result, the only kinds of claims that are likely to succeed outside of a bankruptcy context uh, would be, or even within as a matter of corporate law, would be self-dealing transactions involving boards or officers. Um, you could imagine some of those kinds of claims, however, being brought in the current very fast moving environment, particularly if companies are not keeping up with their own solvency and if they're acting in the ordinary course as if things uh, really do not involve a significant downward effect on their overall capital structure at the moment. Um, having said that, bankruptcy itself clearly is permissible, even if arguably it's going to harm some creditors. As a matter of corporate law, no one ever is going to get in trouble for filing bankruptcy. And so with that as a setup, let me turn it to our panel and uh, Mark Rowe from Harvard. Okay, thanks. Um, my topic for our for my 15 minutes is let me see if I can share a screen. Uh, 
Did I succeed in sharing a screen? You, you did. did. Okay. Uh, okay, good. Um, so my topic for the 15 minutes is uh, mass bankruptcy, clog courts, and whether there's a possibility of a feedback effect to the economy. So rather than focusing on what kind of bankruptcy problems we might have to solve in six months to nine months, um, it's if we have mass bankruptcies and if we have a clogged bankruptcy system, uh, what kind of problems could we end up uh, could we end up having? And I've succeeded in sharing the screen, but I've not succeeded in having the capacity to move it to the next. Okay, I think I did. So it's not too early to think about bankruptcy and corporate financial distress for obvious reasons. Uh, here. Here's a graph that I think probably a lot of us have seen, um, sharp downturn in economic activity in the last several weeks, sharper than we experienced in 2008, 2009. Uh, I saw in the paper this morning that um, JC Penney uh, skipped their interest payment uh, yesterday, and that's the first step to a bankruptcy, and I guess we should be expecting uh, uh, a lot more uh, in terms of bankruptcy. Um, they could be a good news outcome. It could be the disease subsides, uh, we get a cure, um, we get a treatment, um, the CARES Act works well, the economy bounces back in some sort of a V recovery, and we've got some extra bankruptcies for uh, us bankruptcy people to, uh, to worry about, but not something, uh, something systemic. Uh, we'd be okay. Um, alternative um, is uh, the crisis doesn't subside um, or it recurs, the CARES Act doesn't work um, as uh, as planned, and we get a significant, uh, significant bankruptcy, uh, bankruptcy wave. Um, so um, I don't know if this is the tail end of a curve or um, the expected outcome, but if we think everything's going to work out well, um, I don't have anything much to say to people who are thinking everything's going to be okay in uh, in uh, in uh, in six months. Um, this is let's think about what kind of seriously negative feedback effects there could be from a clogged, uh, a clogged bankruptcy system. And I've identified three. Um, maybe you all identify others or say I should take one or more of these off of the, off of the list. One is just the clogged courts themselves, uh, some sort of a bankruptcy gridlock. If we've got a significant portion of the economy in bankruptcy. Um, firms uh, don't work as well in bankruptcy as they work outside of, uh, outside of bankruptcy. Um, second, uh, a little bit more abstract, uh, bankruptcy just doesn't do macro. Um, if we've got a lot of firms in bankruptcy and there's some macro reason why um, uh, the bankruptcy stay should be uh, general and they shouldn't be paying creditors, um, firm bankruptcy system doesn't really focus on the macro impact or the opposite. The financial system is stressed and we should be pulling more money out to unstress the financial system. Bankruptcy doesn't do that, uh, doesn't do that either. Um, the third, a little more subtle, but I think uh, potentially more insidious, is debt overhang. Um, if it's uh, enormous, um, if it's uh, pervasive in the economy, um, it could have a significant feedback effect. Um, uh, due to the overhang, um, firms will be doing less investing, less hiring, they don't move as, uh, move as fast. Um, and that will tend to exacerbate trends in the, uh, in the economy in the next six, eight months uh, anyway. So a little more detail on, on each one of them. Uh, so the first nightmare is, is the overload itself. Um, firms stagnate in bankruptcy and can't get out of bankruptcy quickly enough if the bankruptcy system is overloaded. Um, if it's overloaded and courts can't turn quickly enough to approve uh, new lending, the dip loans, can't turn quickly enough to approve and triage critical vendor orders, um, the firms themselves won't work that well, and then their counterparties um, will not work as well. Uh, more paralysis than we ought, than we ought to want uh, in, this, in the system. If the bankruptcies are delayed, uh, a problem that's not been a problem for the last uh, couple of decades, but was a significant problem in the, um, um, in the 1980s, um, is debtors uh, opportunistically um, act against creditors and suppliers, um, the, um, dragging on a bankruptcy to try to whittle down um, uh, in uh, endless negotiations, uh, creditors in the, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the negotiations over chapter 11. 
Um, so whether this is serious or not depends on whether we think there's going to be uh, serious par paralysis and clogging. And for that, um, see Ben Iverson uh, next, uh, uh, next presentation. So the second bankruptcy nightmare um, is uh, bankruptcy courts have a micro focus. It's the firm in front of it um, that, uh, that the bankruptcy system deals with. It's not really making uh, macro judgments. Um, uh, so one example I say is um, uh, critical vendor orders. Um, the critical vendor order is primarily focused on whether the debtor needs the supplier, not whether the economy needs the supplier. So one can imagine situations uh, with, whereby um, it's in the debtor's interest to reject the contract with a supplier, um, but it's actually in the economy's interest that some key piece in a supply chain persist. Uh, the typical focus for bankruptcy won't take into, that, take into account that macro, uh, macro aspect. Uh, so just in general, bankruptcy is gonna disrupt contracting um, with the uh, with the uh, with the debtor potentially disrupting a supply chain, uh, resembling uh, vaguely contagion in finance. Um, so diagrammatically, a chain of or here I've got a pentagon of con of connected um, uh, suppliers and customers. Um, one could end up rejecting, and that leads to the inability of uh, another one to be able to um, uh, to make good on its uh, on its own contract. Um, good news about bankruptcy uh, is that the new contracts, new contracts can be made and the new contracts can get administrative priority, um, assuring as best the bankruptcy system can that the, uh, that the contract will be, um, uh, uh, will, be, will be on it. So bankruptcy presents a problem, it also presents um, uh, a, a, a solution here. Um, it's imperfect, um, but I suspect it's uh, satisfactory if courts are operating effectively. Um, uh, some commercial uh, arrangements will be frayed, um, but maybe new, more important commercial arrangements will be um, put on top of the old arrangements and get priority in the new world of, uh, of uh, uh, post-COVID-19 uh, post commerce. And so the overall concept for this uh, second nightmare um, is uh, too many bankruptcies disrupt too many commercial relationships, um, but bankruptcy has a bit of a cure for it and that it facilitates the rebuilding by giving administrative priority to the, um, to the new contractual arrangements. Um, imperfect, um, but probably viable. Bankruptcy num uh, nightmare number three, um, it's unable to handle uh, system-wide debt overhang. If the courts are clogged, it may be unable to handle system-wide debt overhang. So just imagine the situation in September, October, 2020, um, when uh, um, uh, the whole S&P 500 is just too overly indebted to operate well. Um, each firm suffers from debt overhang, which in isolation would not be a big problem for the economy. Um, but if the entire economy is suffering from debt overhang, uh, we'll get um, the aggregation of individual firms uh, not making new investments because of the overhang, not making new hires because of the overhang. Um, and this will likely, um, if it happens, uh, exacerbate um, the ongoing contraction. Um, so debt piles up and CARES here may actually be as much of a problem as a solution in that uh, the CARES solution will be to put debt in, um, in some, of, uh, some firms, uh, maybe some equity, but to the extent it's in investing in firms via debt that ends up not being forgiven, CARES actually may not, um, uh, may not be, uh, uh, may contribute to the overhang in, uh, in, uh, in the fall of 2020. So how do we get rid of overhang? Well, for a single firm, we've got two channels to get rid of debt overhang, recapitalization outside of bankruptcy and a reorganization inside bankruptcy. Clogged courts are gonna impede both. And if we've got clogged um, courts and extensive debt overhang throughout the economy, we have a potential feedback uh, problem of significance. So recapitalizations outside of bankruptcy are impeded by uh, semi-bankruptcy law and that bondholders are um, prohibited in the United States, unlike most of the world, from voting on recapitalizations outside of, um, uh, outside of bankruptcy. 
Uh, we know that a lot of attempted recapitalizations fail. Uh, we also know that a lot of recapitalizations aren't even attempted because um, advisors to the company say, you're not going to succeed, um, so don't bother to try. Frequently, when they do succeed, um, it's often because the parties understand that if they don't agree to the recapitalization, the debtor will quickly file a Chapter 11, propose the recapitalization as the plan of reorganization, get it approved because votes can be had in bankruptcy. Um, and so parties outside of bankruptcy are somewhat more willing to agree to what they know will happen in the bankruptcy um, anyway. This is going to work less well if bankruptcy courts are clogged. Um, and that brings us to reorganization in bankruptcy. Um, the, uh, uh, a common method to deal with debt overhang when it's just a bunch of creditors that are overhanging is the prepackaged bankruptcy. Um, they work pretty well in the United States. Um, they're done fairly quickly. Uh, the, the record I saw a couple of months ago, one of them was done in a, a single day. Unusual for it to be done that fast, um, but they are done pretty quickly. Um, if courts are clogged and, they, and the courts can't turn to the prepackaged bankruptcies fast enough, um, the debt overhang will persist. Uh, recapitalizations will be, uh, will be um, uh, that much harder to, uh, to, uh, to uh, bring to fruition and make, uh, make succeed. So my conclusion here is uh, we've got three macro feedbacks um, that we ought to be worried about if there is um, uh, extensive massive bankruptcies. Clogging, uh, clogging the system. And just uh, as I mentioned, um, the bankruptcy courts uh, handle both, well, really three things, uh, large public firm bankruptcies, um, uh, small firm bankruptcies, and individual bankruptcies uh, all, at, all at once. Uh, so any clogging of one is gonna have an impact on, on uh, one of the others. Um, so uh, the, the three ma macro feedbacks that I'm seeing as things to be worried about are the clogging itself, um, uh, the fact that courts don't do macro, um, maybe that's not that big a problem that the micro decisions will aggregate close enough to what we want macro, um, but keep it in mind that it might not aggregate. Um, and the third is debt overhang. Um, if it's pervasive and the courts are clogged, uh, and we have significant overhang, the entire S&P 500 is uh, over indebted, um, the consequence is going to be um, the overhang will induce less investment, uh, less hiring, which are exactly not the things that we will want in the fall of, uh, of 2020. Um, so let's just avoid the problem via sharp economic recovery um, so we don't have to worry about the bankruptcy problems. And Very good. You finished early. Uh, appreciate okay. it. Um, <laughs> I have a little uh, one minute warning that I was going to put up, but um, uh, to, to, re to reproduce the, the conference environment. But uh, uh, with that, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move now to a, a sort of a predecessor question, whether Mark's worries are going to be serious uh, with Ben Iverson. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Everson or Iverson, forecasting bankruptcy court congestion. Take it away. Okay, I'm gonna try to share my screen here. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Yeah, we can okay. hear you great. Yeah, so can, okay. And we can see the slides, thanks. Perfect, okay, great. Um, awesome, well, thanks everyone for tuning in uh, um, and, and for inviting me here. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna basically pick up uh, right where Mark left off um, by talking about uh, whether we can get a sense of how congested courts might become. Um, I essentially uh, never start my talks off uh, with um, caveats, um, but I'm going to do that today. <laughs> uh, because forecasting, I think, is kind of a fool's errand a little bit here. Uh, uh, clearly, this time is different. I've, I've got a graph here of unemployment claims. Um, I'm sure most everyone has seen this graph and like we're literally um, have gone off the charts um, in the recent weeks here. Um, and so who knows, you know, we're so far outside the bounds of what previous data looks like um, that uh, it's very, very hard to like feel like there's an accurate, uh, that we can get, get an accurate uh, prediction here. Um, so I want to say that right up front because 
as I've thought about this and as I've talked about it with, with others, I get a lot of, well, yeah, but, or maybe this or maybe that. And I, and I like 100% agree uh, that like forecasting is, is very, very difficult here. So my goal here is not to give a precise number of bankruptcies that we might see, um, or even like put really tight bounds on what the forecast might be. Instead, I'd, I'd like to just give a sense of what's the likelihood of overloading bankruptcy courts um, and some detail on where the overloading might come from because that can help shape policy as we think about um, uh, you know, what is the right policy response if, we're, if this is a problem that, that we are worried about. So um, with that introduction, let me um, talk briefly about how I'm going to measure caseload. Because I only have 15 minutes, I'm going to leave out a bunch of details here. Um, feel free to, to, to ping me later on if you want details. The simplest way to measure caseload you could, that you could think of would be just total number of filings or total number of filings divided by the number of judges. I'm going to do something similar to that second thing, um, except recognizing that not all cases take the same amount of time. Uh, some bankruptcy cases take a lot more time and some take a lot less uh, time or, or um, time of the bankruptcy judge. So there was a judicial time study done for bankruptcy judges way back in 1991. And as far as I know, it hasn't been updated. Um, so I'm sort of taking those numbers and using those as weight. So for example, the average chapter 11 business bankruptcy case takes about seven and a half hours of a judge's time. Average chapter 13 case takes about 30 minutes of a judge's time. So I'm going to kind of take those weights, sort of recognizing that 1991 was a long time ago, um, but run with them as an approximation of how, how busy uh, courts might be. And so my main measure of caseload is just going to be this weighted number of cases divided by the number of judges. And you can kind of translate this into the hours of required work on cases by bankruptcy judges. Now, importantly, judges do other things besides work directly on cases. Um, the same judge time study sort of suggests that judges spend about half their time on actual cases and the other half on administrative duties, adversarial proceedings, uh, you know, travel, conferences, things like that. Last point I'll make here is, that I think is an important detail is the number of judgeships is determined by Congress. It's been relatively constant over time. We have about 350 now. Um, and it's been around 350 for the past 15 years. Um, of those 350, 18 are temporary five-year judgeships and the rest are the standard 14-year judgeships. Um, finally, like uh, I'm gonna focus on caseload per judge, um, but clearly the whole system could potentially be stressed. We need to worry about number of trustees, um, uh, law clerks, bankruptcy lawyers, other professionals, and they're all going to sort of take on some of the stress of the system. Um, as I'm basically using this caseload measure as an approximation of how stressed the whole system might be. Okay, so that's the introduction of how I'm going to measure um, caseload. Let's like get to some actual pictures here. So here's total caseload over time. That is the red line. I'm also plotting total number of filings in the blue line just so you can get a sense of what things uh, look like and why I think it's important to use caseload rather than number of filings because as we've seen the mix of cases change over time you've seen total filings increase um, and then decrease but caseload has been relatively constant up until the last maybe five or six years when caseload has come down quite a bit. Um, for those who are not aware there's a giant spike in 2005 and a giant drop. Um, in the U.S. there was a big change in the bankruptcy law um, called BAP, BAPSIPA um, that caused this huge shock. I mean, I sort of ignore that and like pretend it doesn't exist um, for now, but that's what's going on if you're wondering what's happening in that graph. Um, two things that I want to point out in this graph. The first one is the gray bars are recessions, and you clearly see in every single recession there's a rise in bankruptcy caseload. Typically it comes sort of halfway through or towards the end of the recession, um, uh, but this is just a very consistent pattern that we see over time. And this is why we would be worried, you know, given that we're clearly entering a significant recession or we're in a significant recession, this is why we're worried about caseload now. Um, second thing is I just want to uh, uh, sort of point out, so uh, just to give a benchmark, the peak in 2010, um, if you sort of back out a rough calculation of like amount of time spent by bankruptcy judges, it comes out to around 50 hours per week of total workload at that peak, and I'm gonna kind of use that as a benchmark to think about where we might end up um, with the current crisis. And then secondly, um, we clearly have some slack now, which I think is really good news. We've sort of seen a, a huge decline in bankruptcy cases over the last 
five or six years. Um, we do have some some slack now, and and um, I think that's sort of important to to keep in mind. Um, if you decompose these bankruptcy caseloads, um, I want to sort of point out how much time judges spend on business versus consumer cases. Um, uh, importantly, you know, U.S. bankruptcy judges deal with both consumer and business cases. They don't specialize in one or the other. Um, and the, your average judge actually spends 75% of their time on consumer cases and only 25% on business cases. Even though the average consumer case takes very little time or a whole bunch of consumer cases never go, go before the judge, there's just so many of them that a lot of judicial time um, is spent with, with consumer cases. And that's been relatively stable over the last 15 or so years that big, uh, business cases make up about 25% of total, of total bankruptcy caseload. Um, okay, so those are just some facts about, um, um, facts about uh, caseload and sort of what it's looked like in the past. Mark already talked a lot about why uh, clogged courts might be costly. I'll just reference here really quickly. We do know a, a, a little bit from actual data that um, uh, bankruptcy courts are costly. Um, so I wrote a paper a few years ago that used that giant big spike in the middle of the graph, the BAPSIPA shock, to show that crowded courts lead to lower recovery rates, more liquidations for small firms, longer durations for large firms. Um, and the thing that I really want to point out here is like, uh, uh, in that paper I used a large um, drop in bankruptcy caseload to identify this. Um, today we're talking about potentially large increase in caseload and, and there's no reason to think that those effects are necessarily symmetric effects, that you sort of see the same thing go in the other direction or not. And I think that's kind of an important thing to have, have in the back of your mind. Um, okay, so I'm going to embark now on my fool's iron of trying to forecast caseload. I'm going to do this in like the simplest way possible. I'm just simply going to correlate uh, unemployment statistics with caseload. I, um, the plan is to do more in the future. I can add in sort of more variables, things at the more local level. Um, but it turns out that unemployment statistics do a pretty darn good job of tracking overall caseload. I'm going to focus on initial unemployment claims, um, but you get basically the exact same picture if you use the unemployment rate instead. So let me just kind of show you the picture because I think it's like actually pretty striking. This is again just at the national level, the red line, total bankruptcy caseload, same line that I showed on the previous graphs, and the blue line is the total number of unemployment claims in millions um, in that same quarter. Um, and you can see here that the two lines track each other really, really closely, uh, with the exception of that one big spike in 2005 um, due to the bankruptcy law change. But just like the raw correlation across these two time series is 0.42, um, and, and it's not insane to kind of like use this as a benchmark to think about uh, uh, how bankruptcy caseloads might adjust as we see unemployment claims um, going up. Um, the other thing, and this was surprising to me when I put this together, is I expected more of a, a lagging relationship between caseload and unemployment claims. Um, but you see it actually spike relatively close to the same time. Uh, I, I would say sort of caseload peaks about two to three quarters after unemployment claims historically. Um, so, um, I kind of thought it might be a longer lead time than that, but the data sort of suggests uh, the the data suggests that that's not the case. That they're like pretty closely correlated one one with another, and there's not a big sort of lead lag relationship. Now, in this graph, I've ended it at the end of 2019, uh, and the reason for that is when I add in the first quarter of 2020 to the unemployment data, you get a graph that looks like this, where now we have this huge spike right at the very end of unemployment claims. Um, and importantly, this only includes through March 31st, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, we've had, since, uh, since this data ends, we've had another 10 million unemployment claims, um, including the like 5 million that were reported this morning. Um, and so like the big question is like, what do you do with something like this? You know, what, what happens when unemployment spikes to such a large extent? Do we expect the same relationship or not? And I think that's a very open question. And that's subject to all of the caveats that I said at the very first. Um, um, so, um, let me sort of give a couple benchmarks, like what would it take to overload the bankruptcy system? So in 2019 in the U S we had about 22,000 business bankruptcies and 750,000 consumer bankruptcies. 
So that's sort of very, very good times. Let's think about it as just like a baseline number of bankruptcies that are going to happen. How much would we need to add on top of that um, to get to a situation where we're fairly stressed? And I'll give you two benchmarks to kind of reference. If we want to get back to that 2010 level of caseload, sort of if I go, I'm going back a few slides here, that 2010 level of caseload that I'm pointing out here, what would that take? We would need an additional 33,000 business bankruptcies and 777,000 consumer bankruptcies. So essentially doubling the caseload from 2019 um, would get us there. Or you could think sort of even farther, what if we want to get to something approximating 60 hours of week per work for bankruptcy judges? We'd need an additional 50,000 business bankruptcies and 1.2 million consumer bankruptcies. So I kind of have that in the back of my mind and then I think, okay, what's the likelihood that we, that we hit those numbers? Let's do a really simple back of the envelope forecast here. Um, since 2008, so just using sort of more recent data, how many bankruptcy filings do we see per every 1 million unemployment claims? Well, we see about 1,900 business filings and 58,000 consumer filings for every 1 million unemployment claims um, during that time period. We've had 22 million unemployment claims in the past four weeks. If that relationship, historical relationship holds up, and of course that's the big if, that we don't really know if that's gonna be the case. If it did, we would see 41,000 additional business bankruptcies and 1.3 million additional consumer bankruptcies. That puts us well over that 2010 benchmark. It puts us almost exactly at the 60 hours a week benchmark that I referenced on the previous slide. So sort of extrapolating from the past, um, that's what we get to. Now, in the, in the couple of minutes I have left here, let me, talk about like the, the what ifs or like this kind of the caveats here. In some ways that sort of back the envelope forecast um, is super optimistic. It assumes A, no additional job losses after this week or no, no additional excess job losses after this week. Clearly that's not gonna happen. It assumes B, that filings are spread out over a whole year. All of those unemployment claims have happened in the same month. And if they don't spread out over a year, let's say they all happen in the same quarter, you'd need to quadruple those caseload numbers. So instead of 60 hours a week, we're talking 240 hours a week and clearly completely overwhelming the bankruptcy system if something like that happened. It's also assuming only two weeks of vacation for bankruptcy judges. And it's not like recognizing the fact that nearly all courts are currently closed for in-person meetings. So they're probably less efficient now than they have been in the past. And importantly, uh, about 65% of bankruptcy judges are over the age of 60. And I would think even if the economy can kind of get back to work, maybe those judges are not gonna be able to go back to in-person meetings for quite some time. Um, and so this inefficiency of the court sort of doubles down on the potential surge in bankruptcy filings. And I think that's important to have in mind. Of course, on the other hand, if the CARES Act works or future stimulus works, if the workers are only temporarily furloughed, then maybe that huge spike in unemployment is not gonna translate into as many bankruptcies. And I, what I'm putting up here is a worst case scenario. And like, these are kind of, because I'm an economist, I always have two hands and these are the two hands that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm kind of weighing against. Um, uh, let me kind of wrap up just to, just to say that um, it, we don't see caseload rising yet. This is now weekly data rather than quarterly data up until the end of uh, March. We don't see an uptick yet. Perfect, John, I got it one minute. I will wrap up in one minute. Um, maybe some early, early signs that business bankruptcies are rising, but consumer bankruptcies have actually fallen in the past uh, week or so. Um, but like the point here is we're, we're, we have the machinery to track this and we're, and we're trying to track this. Last thing is everything I've said is at the national level. And I don't wanna um, just gloss over the point that there's large amounts of heterogeneity across bankruptcy courts. The five busiest districts ten, or the busiest districts in general tend to be in the south, um, plus Detroit. The least busy districts are in more rural areas like the Dakotas, um, rural New England. Those congested courts are about 10 times busier than the least congested courts. Uh, they likely don't have a lot of slack even now, at least according to like my calculations. Um, so maybe there's room for like temporarily shifting judges across districts or something like that. Um, I'm not sure. So with that, I will wrap up. Um, huge question marks about the forecast, of course, but it seems likely that a wave of bankruptcy could overwhelm the system and it's worth thinking about now. 
Importantly, the congestion comes from consumer and small business bankruptcies. So if we can help keep those out of the system, maybe that frees up bankruptcy to deal with the larger firms and, 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 uh, and the larger businesses um, to be able to handle those. Um, yeah, so with that, I will end. And uh, I think I'm turning it over to Ed now, I believe. I just have to Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Ed Morrison, take us away, back to, back to New York. Okay, good, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you, it's a pleasure to join you. I've been watching these proceedings since last night on and off and it's been a very impressive uh, set of panelists but also incredibly useful information. And I hope um, what I can offer now is useful as well. I've learned a lot from my fellow panelists and expect to learn more in the hours ahead. Um, my goal, I think, here is to make the case why a bankruptcy law is an important policy tool during this crisis. And um, I think that's kind of um, in the background, is like, what is bankruptcy good for? And what I'm about to talk to you about is work I've done with my co-author, Andrea Saavedra at, at Columbia. So anyhow, policymakers seem to be viewing bankruptcy as a last resort. You see that in discussion here. You see it in discussion abroad. I think that's a mistake because bankruptcy is a policy tool that can complement current policy efforts. Um, but the role of bankruptcy law during this crisis depends on who we're talking about. We can be talking about, are we talking about consumers, small businesses, or large corporations? And I think the role of bankruptcy differs depending on who we're talking about. For small businesses and consumers, I think that bankruptcy is gonna to have to play a backup role. As I'm gonna explain soon, bankruptcy doesn't offer for most consumers what they need right now. For large corporations, I think that instead of playing a backup role, bankruptcy law can play a primary first line policy, function as a first line policy tool, helping the government target the funds that are needed by firms in a crisis right now. The key intuition here is that many firms enter this crisis financially fragile due to high leverage, due to operational problems, due to the rise in leverage over the past decade. So, for many firms, they're entering this COVID-19 crisis. In some sense, the COVID-19 crisis is accelerating a problem that already existed on their balance sheets. For these kinds of firms, bankruptcy is an important device to cure the financial stress, to cure the operational problems, and bailouts, whether they form in the form of uh, loans or whatever device the federal government or other governments want to use can be done through the bankruptcy process. And in this way, target the loans so that Healthier firms that don't require restructuring can receive those funds outside of bankruptcy, but those that need operational restructuring or financial restructuring receive the funds in the context of bankruptcy. And my main punchline here is that the virtue of targeting funds through the bankruptcy process means that we save businesses, we save jobs, but we're not saving investors. Um, the paradox is that in the United States, most policies rolled out by the federal government, whether through the Treasury or through the Fed, are policies that only provide liquidity to firms outside of bankruptcy. Most of these policies are, um, are uh, firms in bankruptcy are ineligible for most of these policies. And I think that gets it backwards. And in, and in the next round of policy reforms, I think what we should be thinking about is how to better use bankruptcy. And the focus of the discussion should not be avoiding bankruptcy, but how to make it work better. And I think that's a lot of what's in the background of our conversation now is a lot of people today are talking about how to make bankruptcy better. And I think that's, I agree with that because Bankruptcy should not be a last resort, it should be a primary tool. Now, I think I, I can use a few minutes just to lay out why it's a useful tool, because I think that although the, my panelists here will be bored by, by what I'm about to say, our audience includes many people working internationally, and I was impressed by that during the previous hours. And so I think it's important to keep in mind that unlike other countries, United States law, bankruptcy law, is viewed as debtor friendly, okay? And what does that mean to be debtor friendly? It means that bankruptcy, is not simply a way to liquidate. It's not simply a creditor collection device for both consumers and for corporations. It can be a new lease on life, okay? So the first thing to keep in mind that's so different internationally is there's no obligation to file in the United States. No one is obligated to file. Those who do, however, enjoy an immediate pause button, okay? This is an important policy that other countries have rolled out, but the, under the United States law, there's an automatic stay that issues immediately. Those who file immediately get it, and it's, it's a worldwide pause button. It stops all creditor collection efforts, any efforts by counterparties to contracts to terminate those relationships. 
It basically is a form of forbearance, okay? Many policymakers are talking about forbearance and how to roll that out. It's built into the bankruptcy laws. Okay, after the filing of the bankruptcy, the benefit to the per person we're talking about differs. For consumers, the benefit is a fresh start. Debt is wiped out. For businesses, it's you can liquidate in bankruptcy, but that's really not what most businesses go in to do. What they go in to do is to rejuvenate, okay? And the way that's done is by reducing the firm's debts to a level consistent with ability to pay. Typically, that's done of one of two ways. One way is to wipe out the shareholders, convert debt to equity, and allow the firm to exit with the same operations, maybe slightly different operations, but to exit as it was before. We've seen this for plenty of times. United Airlines. Went in, came out. Delta Airlines came in, came out. American Airlines came in, came out. And the story goes on and on, okay? That's one way to get it done. Another way is just to sell the assets to a, to a buyer and then distribute the proceeds to, um, to the investors in order of priority. Again, we've seen this before. And we've seen it during a crisis. We saw it with Chrysler. We saw it with General Motors. So the point here is that the bankruptcy process is a sort of a crisis-proven, time-tested device by which to save viable firms. Important message, the, important, the key ingredient here is that the costs of preserving the firm are borne in large part, usually in exclusive part, by the investors, especially the shareholders, okay? So the point, point is that it's a flexible process too. There are a variety of ways to structure it. Many, many of the most famous corporations in America have come in and come out. I mentioned the airlines, Texaco as well is going in, CIT Group. It's been used in, crisis, in, in financial crises. During the financial crisis of 2008, what happened? Chrysler and General Motors were shattered. What happened? The federal government bailed them out. How did the federal government do that? Through the bankruptcy process. And I think that's a solution, a policy tool that is somehow being overlooked during the current, um, the current crisis, which is very important because many, there's a large percentage of firms that are entering this crisis financially fragile. By some estimates, if you look, depending on the, the breadth you look, that you look at the S&P 500, as of 2019, before the crisis, 4% of those firms could not e did not have EBITDA, or basically operating profits to cover their interest expense. If you look at the Russell, five, uh, Russell 3000, you get to 18% of firms that are unable to cover, cover interest expense. Some institutions call those zombies. So there's a decent percentage of zombies out there. These are the folks that should not be receiving a second lease on life outside of bankruptcy, they should be receiving funding, if necessary, through the bankruptcy process. Now, as great as bankruptcy is, what are its downsides? That the point I want to get across is that my, I see the advantages of bankruptcy as being principally those for large corporations. And you can kind of sense that from the music of the message so far. For consumers and for small businesses, it doesn't make sense to rely on bankruptcy as a, as a policy tool. It's at most a circuit breaker. What we need are what small businesses and consumers need is immediate liquidity and forbearance. Liquidity through th things like the CARES Act, through the federal government, through, through the Federal Reserve's policies. That liquidity and forbearance is not easily accessible through bankruptcy. Instead, the primary benefit of bankruptcy law is to discharge debt. That's not what most consumers need right now. It's not what small businesses need right now. Many of them are solvent in the long run. They don't need to wipe out their debts. They need cash to ride out the crisis. So bankruptcy will be used by many businesses, but that should not be the front line of attack. It should be viewed that we need other policies to come in, save those institutions, save the, save the, the people, the small businesses, and rely on bank and count on bankruptcy being used if those policies fail. Um, what it also means is that we need to work on the capacity of our courts because these policies will inevitably be unsu unsuccessful for some people, for some firms, and we need to build up the capacity of our courts, as Ben Iverson was just explaining. Um, there's even a deeper point it's worth mentioning along the way, which is that bankruptcy is, in some sense, something we do want to avoid for many small businesses. For many small businesses, going into bankruptcy is extremely costly. For many small businesses, that it means that the, that the um, owner manager will burn up up to 30% of firm value just navigating this process. Small wonder that for every 100 firms that shut down, only 20 actually file for bankruptcy. What this means is that our bankruptcy process is extremely costly for small businesses. Reforms have been done. 
to now, uh, uh, just recently, but they're still unproven. You still worry that many small businesses are gonna see bankruptcy as a very costly enterprise that they don't want to use, that they might rather shut down instead of using bankruptcy. All that is just gets to the key point, which is that if our goal in this crisis is to save businesses, bankruptcy is not going to be an optimal way to do that for small businesses and for um, consumers. But, it, but in some sense, you might say, what's the ideal solution? The ideal solution is to provide liquidity to save businesses, but not investors. If you think about it, that in the mass of small businesses, it's very difficult to figure out which businesses need liquidity um, outside of bankruptcy versus in. Okay, you know, for the, you might say that the businesses that could merit financial aid outside of bankruptcy are those that are healthy, that are not over levered, that could have, that were not fragile going into this crisis. There are other kinds of businesses that need to be, that have other problems that can be addressed in bankruptcy and to provide f financial assistance to these businesses without requiring a bankruptcy filing is just to allow shareholders to kick the can down the road. For small businesses, it's hard to, to separate the viable from the non-viable the firms that don't need restructuring from those that do. It is a lot easier for larger corporations. And it's for that reason, I think that it's a mistake by, for, among policymakers to not take chapter 11, the restructuring provisions of our bankruptcy code seriously in thinking about how to restructure uh, larger corporations. Um, we know who these businesses are. It's easy to identify those that have the operational and financial problems, unlike small businesses where there's a paucity of data. And so the virtue of, 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 let me just pause it. What I'm advocating is that for policymakers to take seriously the idea that money can still be used to bail out large corporations, but in the context of a bankruptcy process that solves fundamental problems, but also limits the burden on the treasury. Instead, uh, instead of offering loans outside of bankruptcy, offering them in bankruptcy forces the investors in the firm to bear the costs of the restructuring process. Instead of forcing the public to bear those costs outside of bankruptcy. We've seen it work before, as I've mentioned, in the General Motors and the Chrysler um, uh, bankruptcies. And let me just pause with um, what this means, I think, and this is consistent with the other messages that my panelists are bringing across, is that if bankruptcy is an important policy tool, either because it's a backup, it's gonna be used by lots of consumers and small businesses, whether we like it or not, and we need to gear up, or because it should be used as a frontline tool in allocating funds to large corporations. Either way, we need to improve our bankruptcy process and think about what ways can we improve the ability of the bankruptcy process to move quickly. And a lot of, a lot of thought is, being going into that, is going into that now, and that need, that's sort of like the frontier. I think that what we need to be thinking about is how, as Mark was saying, how can we design new policies that allow for quick sales, for quick pre-packs, or as uh, Joe Stiglitz has been talking about, some super chapter 11 process. None of these are pipe dreams. Congress has, over the past few years, been creative in enacting legislation that offers the benefits of bankruptcy to the whole country or to a wide group of people. Several years ago, I think it was 2013, Members of the military were offered the benefit of the automatic stay without having to file for bankruptcy. Okay, so there's, we have templates out there and that's what we need to be thinking about is how to provide the benefits of bankruptcy, the discipline of bankruptcy, the protection of the public fisc through bankruptcy, but to speed up that process and to make it more efficient. And I look forward to the next set of conversations because I'm sure that's much of, much of what we're going to be talking about. I hope I didn't go over my time, John, but I'm, I probably... Nope. No, you're 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 one minute early, so much appreciated. Thanks, thanks, Ed, um, and that's a good uh, uh, setup for uh, a later uh, panel uh, member who's going to talk about the CARES Act. In the meantime, we're going to turn to David Skeel um, from Pennsylvania. David, thanks, John. Uh, you look very cozy there, <laughs> um, and I I take it my uh, my microphone is on. So. My task is uh, either a, a lot easier or a lot harder uh, than the panelists who have uh, gone so far because uh, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about and what I've been thinking about and writing about the last few weeks draws on their work. So uh, Mark and Ben and Ed all have written uh, things that, uh, that play very much into my own thinking and what I'll be talking about. 
Um, what Ed just said, uh, I will be repeating uh, an enormous amount of. I'll be saying a lot of the same things. I think the main difference will be I will be speaking more from the glasses uh, half empty um, perspective, um, whereas I take uh, Ed to be think, uh, speaking more from the uh, glasses half full perspective about bankruptcy. To put this in, comma, in context for me personally, um, ever since I wrote a history of bankruptcy uh, almost 20 years ago now, I've been a huge advocate of, uh, of the American system of bankruptcy in general and of chapter 11 uh, in particular. I think it works very well. I think the way uh, it emerged historically in the 19th century was the greatest innovation of the common law um, in the United States. I think it still generally works fairly well um, but I also think it has some major limitations in this kind of a context. Um, and that's what I'd like to talk about. What I'd like to do in uh, my 15 minutes is talk briefly about uh, three limitations of um, bankruptcy in the current context, of chapter 11 in the current context, um, two of which uh, have already been discussed to some um, extent. And then talk about three of what I think of as implications or opportunities or things we ought to be uh, doing in the current environment. So three limitations um, and then three implications and opportunities. Um, the first of the limitations picks up where, kind of where Ed let it, uh, ended up, uh, picks up at, towards the end of Ed's remarks. And that is that chapter 11, to the extent our objective in the current environment is to see it reorganize um, businesses, chapter 11 does not work well for small and uh, medium-sized uh, businesses. As Ed has mentioned, and as he's written about, um, small and medium-sized businesses, small businesses in particular in bankruptcy, sometimes eat up. Uh, in the neighborhood of 30% of their value during the bankruptcy process. Substantial majority of them never see the light of day again. Either they're liquidated in bankruptcy or the bankruptcy is dismissed and they're shut down. So to the extent that we're looking uh, for chapter 11 to be a way to rescue many of the small and medium-sized businesses, uh, that are in trouble right now, I think we need to be very cautious about our expectations for uh, how well bankruptcy will do that. The second of the three limitations is that uh, bankruptcy appears to function quite differently um, when the courts are congested than when they're not congested. This has been Iverson's um, work uh, where uh, he showed, uh, as he was talking about earlier a little bit, that small firms are even more likely to be liquidated if, if courts are, are congested. Um, with larger firms, they do tend to reorganize, but it takes longer, they stay in bankruptcy longer, and uh, the process ends up being more expensive. Um, ben did put the important caveat on this study that it, it was a study um, at a time when bankruptcies were falling, caseloads were falling rather than rising. Uh, it may be that your results at home, our results at home may be different um, in the current environment, um, but I suspect that a, a heavily stressed bankruptcy system is likely to be a system that's gonna work less well um, rather than more well, at least if nothing has changed about the way um, we use bankruptcy. The final limitation of chapter 11 right now that I'll mention is that uh, chapter 11 for most firms that reorganize uh, depends on the firm's access to uh, financing during the bankruptcy process, what's known as debtor in possession financing. Um, in the current environment, the debtor in possession financing market is extraordinarily stressed. Um, in the past, debtor in possession financers have almost always been paid in full, uh, taken no loss whatsoever on their debtor in possession financing. 
that appears to be rapidly changing, at least in the short run. There was a case a couple of weeks ago, a case that's in chapter 11 right now, called Sanchez Energy, where the debtor announced that the dip financer is not going to be paid in full. And in fact, it looks like the dip financer will, be en will end up having to take equity for a big chunk of its stake. So the third limitation is that uh, debtor in possession financing, which really is the grease that makes the process go in many, um, in many bankruptcies. It has upsides and downsides with it, but it is essential. Um, is very, very stressed uh, in the current environment. So that's where we are. Those are the limitations of chapter 11 or some of the main limitations of chapter 11 in the current environment. Um, let me turn uh, with the time that I have left to what I see as implications and opportunities that uh, derive from uh, those limitations. In some ways, the most important uh, uh, implication is that it is essential, in my view, um, to minimize the number of bankruptcies that we have in the coming months. And I, I differ a little bit with Ed's suggestion that we want to um, funnel lots of cases through Chapter 11 and that it's a bad idea, and I'm overstating Ed's point, I know, um, to prevent bankruptcies, or at least to prevent uh, many bankruptcies, uh, I think we really should be focusing on um, preventing as many bankruptcies as possible, um, uh, given the nature of the crisis, which is a completely unexpected shock, and the potential downside of having a huge flood of bankruptcies um, into the system. Um, Ken Ayotte and I have uh, written a little bit about this, um, we use the expression borrowed from the virus crisis itself that it is really important to flatten the bankruptcy um, curve, if at all possible. One thing that might help in that regard, in addition to the funding that's coming from Washington under the CARES Act and under the Federal Reserve programs that are being set up, is some, some kind of standstill, um, which, uh, which Ed also mentioned, uh, perhaps a temporary standstill on collection. Um, there are ad hoc versions of that going into place uh, already right now. I think it may be too late for that kind of a standstill to be effective. If there is one, I think it, it would need to be very, very limited in um, in its, uh, the time that it was in place, a standstill being just an across the board bankruptcy like rule that said um, creditors cannot collect for say three months um, what they are, um, they are owed. Um, as I've just uh, suggested, I, I have mixed feelings about that right now. I would have been enthusiastic about it a month or six weeks ago. But the basic point is the remain, uh, remains the same. I think it's really important to try to reduce the number of bankruptcies. I think the, the, the bankruptcy system, among other things, will be uh, work better if, if that is done. Um, the second uh, point that I'd like to make is that I think the government has an important role to play in the bankruptcy and near bankruptcy fund, um, funding context making a point very similar to the point that Ed was making. I completely agree that the government uh, needs to be a major player um, in this context. I also agree that it is highly unfortunate that the CARES Act um, discourages funding in bankruptcy. The CARES Act keys the main funding part of the act to uh, Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act, which doesn't allow the Federal Reserve to lend to businesses that are in bankruptcy. I think this can be navigated around. It can be navigated around, for instance, by funding to firms before they actually file for bankruptcy. Um, but I do think it's a problem. Um, I do think that it's essential that the government be involved in the dip financing market now, particularly when it's under stress, as much stress as it is. Um, at the same time, I also want to emphasize that I don't think that there is an either or uh, choice between government financing and private financing in the dip financing context. 
Um, I think there are going to be problems on the, on the uh, private financing side um, in the near term. I think the government's role is essential. I think the government needs to, to do a, a lot of direct lending. But I also think we should be thinking about ways to bridge those two, to use the um, government lending as a way to unfreeze the private dip financing market. And one way to do that might be for the government to take pieces of private um, dip financing loans. Um, uh, the government to either guarantee a piece of the loan or take a piece of the loan, which is a strategy that's very consistent with um, the kind of uh, strategies that are um, suggested in the CARES Act itself. Uh, again, subject to the CARES Act um, discouragement of lending to firms that are in fact in, um, in bankruptcy. The final point I'll make here uh, is just that I, I think uh, it, it can't be bankruptcy as usual. I think bankruptcy needs to be used creatively in this context. Um, and, and one way to do that might be to do something like a, a, a cookie cutter system of prepackaged bankruptcies. Now, this is a little bit like the um, Stiglitz approach uh, that the, uh, the Stiglitz uh, proposal that Ed referred to a few minutes ago for a super chapter 11. It's a little bit different, I think, than what Joe has in mind. But to the extent that the government could use its financing leverage to encourage very quick bankruptcies, particularly for companies that are amenable to that kind of a solution, which uh, uh, tends to be companies with a relatively simple capital structure, ideally with one class of debt that most needs to be um, restructured, um, I think that uh, the bankruptcy process could be routinized uh, in that way, sort of super, uh, super prepack rather than super um, chapter 11. Again, uh, two points to conclude on or two general points I'd want to make. One is that I think it's really important to, uh, if at all possible, to flatten the bankruptcy curve, to reduce the number of, of coming bankruptcies. Second point is I think bankruptcy has to be used creatively and I think uh, it's gonna be essential that the government be right in the middle of the process. And I will uh, stop with that. Great, thank you, David, very much appreciated. Um, we're, we're staying right on track. I have anything, um, simply fill the slight gap to make sure the next speaker is ready to go. Now, let me make sure Luigi's on. Luigi, are you are you on? Yeah, uh, you're on. Good. Uh, you want to go ahead and start early? You get a couple of extra minutes. I've never known sure. Luigi. Sure. Uh, with with pleasure. Filling up the time. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So first of all, thank you for uh, hosting me in this uh, uh, marathon across continents. And uh, I find a bit uh, strange because I'm put in the middle of a session on bankruptcy. Uh, but uh, talking about uh, an act that is supposed to reduce or eliminate bankruptcy, uh, but with a title saying that um, I should be against this act altogether. Um, so let me uh, qualify and, and try to set uh, the record straight. So I think that uh, I agree with uh, what most people have said so far, that uh, this is a, a major crisis that needs major action, including uh, some major government intervention to avoid uh, uh, bankruptcy, especially of small businesses. Uh, one aspect that has, has emerged very clearly from the research of all of you guys and, and repeated in this uh, seminar is that uh, bankruptcy is particularly costly um, for small businesses. And so we want to avoid that in addition to the significant output uh, that is lost due to uh, this pandemic, there is also an additional loss uh, by, uh, produced by the dissolution uh, through bankruptcy, uh, or even not dissolution, but through the, the, the loss in bankruptcy of a lot, a lot of small businesses that find themselves uh, um, without uh, uh, revenues for a, for a long period of time. So I think that the government should intervene. My uh, objections with the CARES Act is not about whether the government should or should not intervene, is the way it was designed 
I think is particularly uh, inefficient and, uh, and well cost us dearly in, in many ways that I will explain in a second. Uh, but let me start uh, from uh, first principles. I, as an economist, I like to think about first principles. And, and so uh, when we design a government intervention, uh, what is the government intervention supposed to do? Uh, so first of all, uh, I'm stating the obvious and something that uh, I have no comparative advantage in discussing. So I'm not gonna uh, spend too much time discussing, but I mentioned because it's important and I don't want people to go to their conclusion that because I don't mention it's not important is, is the government needs to de de deploy serious resources to fight the disease uh, and to find a way out of this disease. Whether we like it or not, uh, I think that the only real way out is through uh, medical innovation. Um, and, uh, and in the meantime, also uh, support of the healthcare system and uh, being able to handle even peaks of uh, um, high level of uh, IC units demand is crucial. So I think that uh, the first uh, and most important uh, uh, goal of any government intervention should be that. Uh, this said, as I said, I'm not an expert to say how much money is needed, how is best deployed and et cetera. So I will move quickly to the part that I have uh, at least a comparative advantage. Not, not sure that I have an absolute advantage, but at least a comparative advantage. And this is uh, um, the other two goals, in my view, of uh, any government intervention. The first one is to uh, produce what we call uh, in economics risk sharing. So to divide to the burden of the shock um, in a way that is most bearable for uh, the community. And uh, because this intervention is done at a national level, this is of course done only within the boundaries of the country that uh, is deciding this. Now, an interesting example or counterexample is the European Union, because in some aspect uh, pretends to be a, a nation, uh, in others has no way to do this uh, reshaping. And, and as I argue as well, including a piece on the Financial Times, I think that it, to me is a fate and flow of the European Union that if it's not fixed now, might lead to a, a dissolution in one form or another in a relatively short period of time. But this set aside, the goal within uh, a nation is to uh, uh, distribute the burden in a way um, that is uh, uh, not only more fair from a political point of view, but also more acceptable in the sense, ex ante, the reason why uh, we, we accept also to have some form of uh, uh, welfare is that we think that resharing is an important component uh, that governments should play, and in particular is important in a pandemic of this extent. The second goal, which is uh, also very important, is to minimize the uh, efficiency losses that are introduced by the pandemic. And uh, uh, we have to realize, and this is uh, of course obvious to all of you who are economists of law and economic guy, but uh, it's not so clear in the political debate, is uh, the pie has shrunk and shrunk dramatically. So it's not possible to make everybody whole here because there's not enough money to do it. So the question is not this, the question is to allocate the burden uh, more appropriately if you want, and second, to minimize uh, the uh, cost uh, of, uh, the efficiency cost, for example, of uh, undue number of ba bankruptcy. Uh, of course, at the le in the least costly way, because uh, uh, we might be in for significant government support for a significant amount of time, and so being cost effective is, is very important. So let, let's talk about the first goal. And, and uh, I, one aspect that uh, is not being discussed enough by, in the pandemic uh, literature is that uh, this shock uh, has dramatic uh, uh, across generation uh, redistributional issue in the sense that uh, uh, left to its own device, this uh, virus uh, is very costly for elderly people and much less cost, costly for uh, younger people. Um, I should say older and, and younger because I happen to be kind of in the area where this starts to kick. So I have to be careful not including me among the elderly people. But anyway, you get the point. Um, so uh, interestingly, uh, the intervention that have been designed so far, and maybe in the future there will be other with different characteristics, but the intervention, the known pharmaceutical intervention that have been designed so far are particularly costly for young people 
and much less so for all the people. Uh, why? Because uh, if the virus threatens the, the lives of all the people, uh, the remedy threatens the livelihood of younger people and not touching very much the uh, livelihood of older people. Part of it because older people are retired and their pension keeps coming in. Part of it because they tend to have uh, with age more uh, managerial roles that are uh, less likely to be impacted in the same way as uh, the more uh, manual tasks uh, that are done more th by younger people. So I think that there is a dramatic uh, redistribution. So vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the baseline, which is the virus has arrived, nobody is responsible for this, the virus has arrived and is killing a lot of older people. We intervene to save the lives of a lot of old people by basically de facto putting a gigantic tax on young people. So one of the things that uh, the ECAS Act should do, in my view, should be tax the old and redistribute to the young. After all, the, the old are getting a gift and the gift is probably for many 20 years of extra life. Uh, that's not a minor gift that we receive. Uh, that gift does not come for free. Um, and uh, I'm very much a Chicago guy. There is no free lunch and there is no free, free sort of gift. And, uh, and I think that uh, the cost of this is borne mostly by uh, um, younger people. And so what the ACARES Act should do is to, should do this, uh, uh, at least start doing this redistribution. And uh, I understand we are in a political uh, climate these days in the United States, but there is zero of that. Uh, there is zero of how we're gonna pay for it. And uh, if the answer is that eventually we're gonna impose a major wealth tax, a, a once in a lifetime wealth tax to pay for this, is pretty highly correlated with uh, uh, age. So it might not be the, the, the most terrible way to deal with it, but I think that uh, should be clear what uh, how we're gonna pay for it in, in one way or another, um, because that also will uh, dampen the incentives to distribute money for free. So in that, in that front, so on objective number one, uh, there is some uh, money distributed to the people who need the most, but uh, in a very inefficient way. So the free money, the $1,200 given to everybody uh, above a certain income level is uh, ridiculous. In, in a sense, uh, there are a lot of people who are employed and they receive uh, happily employed, nothing changed in their life, they receive a gift. Uh, a gift, why, is not clear. Um, of course, they don't mind to receive a gift, but, uh, but I think it's not optimal policy by any form or shape. Uh, there is uh, a lot of money allocated for a lot. There is some money allocated for uh, extending and making more comprehensive unemployment insurance. Uh, this is great, except that uh, the system of employment insurance in the United States does not seem to be working particularly well uh, in this dimension. And then the big chunk of the uh, CARES Act is divided into two programs, the so-called small firm programs and, uh, and the uh, loans for large firms. So when it comes to the small firm program, the idea is to extend uh, loans that uh, will be forgiven, uh, extend loans to small firms defined as firms uh, with less than 500 employees that will be forgiven if the proceeds of these loans are mostly used to uh, pay for um, uh, payroll, uh, rent, and uh, utility bills. And uh, now there are a number of problems with this uh, approach. Uh, the major one I see is there is no screening whatsoever for need, uh, for need base. And uh, so if you are Zoom, Zoom, the company that is producing what we're using now, you're booming as of today. I don't know how many employees there are. I imagine there are less than 500 employees. There is nothing, as the way I understand, nothing in the law to say they cannot apply <coughs> to receive a loan that would be forgiven because sure enough, they're not gonna fire anybody. They, they actually are gonna hire a massive amount of money because they're expanding. So why sh we should be in the business, why my tax dollars should be in the business of subsidizing Zoom in this moment defies me. Um, the, the second problem, uh, which is big, is, uh, uh, is defined as number of employees. But uh, if you are in a lot of businesses with uh, very high 
uh, value added um, or very high capital. You might be a gigantic firm managing a lot of money, but have less than uh, 500 employees. So imagine that I am uh, a major Moogle fund company. Uh, I'm doing uh, pretty well now. Maybe uh, the volatility certainly have kept uh, me uh, alive, but uh, uh, I don't think that uh, I cannot work from home. I don't think that uh, uh, I'm majorly disrupted. And I still can apply for this uh, because I'm less than 500 employees. And um, the third thing is that uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear to me, the government decided to uh, administer this program through banks. And uh, not all, so I'm not too much concerned about the money that banks will make. Um, I don't think it's excessive. Maybe it is, but I, that's in the grand scheme of things. Unfortunately, billions these days are peanuts in the in the, in the face of trillions uh, or hundreds of billions deployed. So that's not the, the major problem. The major problem is that uh, uh, banks are number one overwhelmed. Number two, uh, they are sometimes reluctant to take uh, new customers because they have uh, anti-money laundering provisions. There are other provisions that uh, create some potential liability. So they are not gonna extend uh, those loans exactly to the, the dinky firms that need the most. So if I am a pretty large organization, well uh, structured, uh, I probably have a good legal department that help me file for this and I can extract money in if, if I don't need it. If I am a, a little uh, falafel stand at the corner, I don't have any lawyer. I don't even know, how, I don't have a bank. I don't know to apply. That guy that is probably the one who needs this the most is gonna receive this the least. So because I don't wanna just be a, a critics, I wanna provide alternatives. My favorite alternative would be to go through the social security administration. Uh, the social security, is the organization in the United States that has the best record of how much each one of us is paid. Why? Because uh, I still have to file my 2019 taxes. So the, uh, the IRS knows at best my income of 2018. Uh, the Social Security received a contribution of my uh, salary last month. So they have everything updated to the last month. And the Social Security is in the business of uh, uh, paying people money, not only receiving through uh, the pension. So uh, they are ready to deploy money. And there is no intermediary. In the sense that create, creating the banks as a filter is only making problem works. And, and the second point is you need to put some uh, uh, mean testing because the money is running out fast. And uh, I said that when the CARES Act was approved and uh, I've never been right so fast because within a week, Congress was there to ask for more money because it seems that uh, uh, the money they allocate is not enough. So the beauty of doing through the social security system is that uh, you can extend it as a loan subject to verification exposed that your sales went down. And uh, if they didn't, you have to return the loan. If they did, you actually have your loan forgiven. So. I think that this will not be an obstacle to handing out this money fast, uh, but it will be a way to make sure that uh, they are not the usual uh, 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 people that take advantage of the situation. And uh, the fact, by the way, that uh, uh, the system is not working, that the EKS is not working, is that we have now 25 million new unemployed at the same time in which we have exhausted the money that uh, uh, CARES Act uh, allocates for uh, small businesses to avoid uh, unemployment. So I don't understand how these are uh, both true at the same time. Uh, but the worst part of the CARES Act, uh, the, the crown jewel of cronies, is the uh, $450 billion that uh, Treasury is gonna give to the Fed that can leverage it up up to 10 to one to lend what it amounts to 4.5 trillion dollars to the economy in the next year to the full discretion of the Federal Reserve Board. So basically what you can think about it is that uh, in the next year, the capital market in the United States has been abolished because 4.5 trillion correspond to 
the amount of money that uh, the financial system intermediated for firms uh, through the banking sector and the, the bond market in year 2019. So basically, the Fed has become the central planning organization of the entire US economy with basically very little supervision. And that to me is the worst part. He's on time. Thank you, Luigi. Much appreciated. I agree with you completely, by the way, about social security. Seems like the right channel. Zoom, for what it's worth, according to their 10K, had 2,500 employees as of Okay, so it does not qualify. Thank you for checking me. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. And it's not the other Zoom that our highly efficient markets allowed the stock price to spike until the point at which they had to suspend uh, trading. Um, okay, uh, onwards. Uh, Alan, uh, you're there. You made it. Excellent. Um, uh, Please tell us uh, why our bankruptcy system uh, it needs updating. Uh, well, good. I, I'm not sure I'm going to take my full 15 minutes, so I'm going to make discussions happy. Um, uh, uh, the, I want to explain a little bit about the title, which is absolutely bankruptcy law. So um, the bankruptcy, the business sections of the bankruptcy code were last amended in 1978. And uh, have been uh, and have not been materially amended since. Um, as uh, everybody knows, financial markets perform very, very differently these days than they did in 1978. Uh, and so, uh, the statute, which in 1978 was somewhat in sync with financial practice of the 60s and 70s, is, it has essentially very little to say about financial practices that go on today. So many of the many of the sections of the statute essentially provide no guidance whatsoever to bankruptcy courts and to appellate courts, which essentially means that what we really now have today in bankruptcy is is, is that federal judges are developing a common law of bankruptcy. And so, if you really want to know um, what bankruptcy is like in the United States. Um, it, it's almost like feels like contracts and torts where you have to read the opinions because the statute won't um, will essentially not tell you what's actually going on. Um, so if you're going to understand um, what's going on in bankruptcy or predict what's going on in bankruptcy, a lot of your effort should be asking what judges as human beings are going to be doing because judges, even in the good times, essentially have been making bankruptcy law up for the last 20 years. Um, now, what I'm... Uh, going to uh, talk about um, for the um, for my for the time I'm going to uh, I have is I'm going to talk about some technical sections of the bankruptcy code um, how they work and what and what their possible macro effects would be effects on bankruptcy on, on parties um, but I think uh, the real point that I want to make is that um, while I'm talking about sections of the code their their sections which authorizes the judges essentially to make things up as they go along. So the first uh, section I'm going to talk about, um, I, I would talk about in, in this way. Um, a lot of firms make long-term contracts which, um, so that there's periodic performances through time. Before 1978, there used to be a term in, the, in many of these contracts, which essentially defined an insolvency as a breach of contract. And what that, what that would mean would be that the supplier to the long-term contract, we're thinking of buyers who go broke, we're thinking of the supplier, the supplier could exit if there was an insolvency. Now this didn't mean that the supplier would exit. What it meant would be that there would be a renegotiation in which if the contract was worth more to the firm than it cost the supplier to perform, the contract would remain in force under modified terms. In 1978, what the bankruptcy code did was it gave the uh, insolvent firm the power to, quote, assume, close quote, a contract um, and essentially refuse to enforce the term that said insolvency was a breach. So what that meant was that um, firms had in, in bankruptcy had an incentive to as assume contracts, uh, which may be inefficient to perform, but where the price was a little uh, lower than the, the benefit to the firm. Now, what, to be sure, under the statute, the um, insolvent firm uh, had to give assurances to the supplier that in the future, if the supplier continued to perform, the supplier would be paid. 
But these assurances were assurances that had to be satisfactory to a judge, not the supplier. That is, if the supplier didn't like them, the judge would give assurances. So there was, even in good times, an incentive for firms to assume too many contracts. Now, what's going on these days is that firms are going to assume every contract they can possibly assume. Um, uh, just in, because if they can assume these contracts, liquidations will occur for sure. Uh, so what really um, is going to be happening is that the bankruptcy judges are going to be ruling on whether or not um, the probability of performance is high enough to justify assumption. And since bankruptcy judges are looking into the abyss and have a general continuation bias anyway, one of the effects of this minor technical rule is that you're going to get a lot more chapter 11s because firms will be able to keep contracts in force so that it's possible even to file for chapter 11 because if they couldn't keep contracts in force, all the suppliers would exit and we'd have liquidations. So one of the stresses on business bankruptcy law uh, that people don't really realize is that it isn't only the macro factors that were so intelligently um, uh, put forward in the last a few uh, hour or so, but it is, it's going to be the ability of firms to keep suppliers in the game uh, and, to, and, to, and to file for chapter 11s. And the uh, only other point that I want to make about this section is that because it's being anticipated, what you're going to get um, is a lot more short-term contracts because if the contract ends, you can't assume it. And so the section in the best of times creates an incentive for artificially or inefficiently short contracts or contracts that people would not write short term if there wasn't the law. Um, and that, that practice, I think, is also going to be exacerbated with macro inefficient effects. Um, I think the second um, rule that I um, want to talk about, it's a pretty technical rule, is um, that ever since the 1930s, I guess, since the 1930s, um, firms cannot um, contract out of bankruptcy. So you can't, you, you can't write a contract which says, well, I'm only going to, I'm going to liquidate if I'm insolvent or, um, or I'm going to uh, reorganize if I'm insolvent or I'm going to have this restructuring practice or that restructuring practice. Um, to be a little more precise, you can write those things, but the debtor can file for bankruptcy regardless of what the contract says. So essentially you can't, um, you basically, you can't contract out of bankruptcy. So what does this essentially mean? It means that a whole lot of the action when a firm becomes insolvent is, is the product of a renegotiation rather than the product of an original contract. And what do the um, renegotiations do? Well, that's really where debtor in, in, in possession financing comes into effect. That is the firm will renegotiate with credit is to attempt to get more liquidity um, and uh, uh, but it will have to provide the creditor with some kinds of assurances or terms. And what the practice is that we essentially have uh, been seeing um, is that the lenders um, uh, more and more have been insisting on very strong covenant protection and also the right to have the firm sold uh, if, the, um, if the firm can't make its numbers. And these uh, contracts have been um, uh, essentially, uh, uh, that is bankruptcy courts have been enforcing these contracts or there's a tendency for them to enforce more and more of these contracts. And I think that tendency is going to be um, increased because bankruptcy courts will realize that if they don't enforce contracts that for sales, um, uh, and, uh, and tightly regulate the debtor's business, uh, debtor in financing, debtor in possession financing will not be available. And, and once again, that'll force lots of firms to liquidate. Um, but what, um, what this is, uh, what this, um, uh, what these covenants and requirements to sell produce, uh, particularly in these very hard times, is a lot of sales. And, and the problem with a lot of sales is that right now you or what you are soon going to see um, is a lot of sales of insolvent firms or parts of insolvent firms into an illiquid market. Uh, so uh, there is um, a well-known, I think, uh, fire, fire sale problem with insolvency. The problem is if, if you, when firms become um, basically the weaker firms in an industry are the ones that will become insolvent 
but the other firms in the same industry sometimes tend to be liquidity constrained. But so if you have, but if you have these contracts where the lenders are going to force sales, um, you're going to get a, a, a huge amount of assets dumped in markets, and that's going to be having a very serious dampening effect on asset prices. So one of the things that people um, should realize about that or in, in possession financing is that in hard times, it, it, there's going to be a major depression of asset prices. Um, and that's actually not going to have very good macro effects. There's also um, a more subtle, inefficient counterweight to this, which is that you're going to, you may be getting many more collusive auctions. So what do I mean by a collusive auction? Well, there is a, a tendency sometimes for, um, uh, for, a, um, the, for a, a senior lender to finance um, the purchase of the firm by the old equity. Um, and what would, be the, what would be the reason to do that? Um, it's because the senior lender will finance at the expected option value. Um, and what, what, that, what that will mean is that that will really deter entry. Because if the firm is going to, um, uh, uh, if, if the firm essentially is, is going to be able to bid the mean of the option value, um, uh, the people won't overbid. And the reason the secured lender does this is because it reduces variance um, and, re and reduces the exposure of the secured lender. So you have, in, in, particularly in jurisdictions like Sweden, where there are required auctions all the time, um, what you tend to get is that the old equity buy the firm a whole lot of the time and, and, the, and, and, and the auction doesn't, essentially you're gonna get an inefficient auction because the highest valued um, entrant is not gonna, or potential entrant isn't gonna win. So under better in finance, possession financing, particularly in hard times, you have a huge fire sale problem and a collusive auction problem, and the statute doesn't do anything to prevent um, either of these things. Um, I think the third um, uh, technical rule that I want to talk about in bankruptcy is something called the um, absolute priority rule. Um, and the um, uh, absolute priority rule uh, essentially um, is a rule that, that um, in its ordinary statement is pretty uncontroversial. It says the creditors should be paid in the order of their claims. So the secured lender, the senior lender should be paid first, the junior lender should be paid next, the equity shouldn't really get anything at all. The, um, one of the problems with the um, uh, with the absolute priority rule is that it tends to freeze these contract rights as of the time of money being borrowed. Because if you really view um, uh, the secured lenders as, as contract parties and the junior lenders as contract parties and everybody is a contract party and it's all a creation of contract, but what we know about contracts is that they're often renegotiated when the state of the world changes. So one of the renegotiations that has been attempted over the last few years, even in good times, is for the senior lenders to want to give up value to the equity to keep them in the game because of the managerial skills and other contributions that they make. But um, the, that may leave inter, intermediate classes not being paid in full. And that shouldn't be a problem because the intermediate classes contract for, uh, that is their payoff isn't reduced by a deal between the seniors and the equity, uh, and they essentially contract just to be paid behind. So they don't, you would think, have a contract claim. But under the, the common law of absolute priority, seniors can't give up value to equity. Um, so what that is going to mean, it, 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 that usually is not a terribly serious problem, but in these days it could be a terribly serious problem because if the equity are the best people to run the firm, and they have no incentive to run the firm, that's gonna force more sales. So the way that the absolute priority rule works under the law today is it works in combination with debtor and possession financing, essentially to, uh, to, to what you're going to see, I, and I would predict is huge fire sales of assets and, and a depression on asset prices that people haven't really been, been looking forward to or anticipating. Um, I think the, Next rule that I want to make is a, is a part of the Bankruptcy Act, um, 
that could be that was involved in the previous in bailouts during the Great Recession. Um, when a firm files for Chapter 11, it doesn't necessarily mean that the firm gets reorganized. The firm could be sold as a unit, or most of it could be sold as a unit, even though the firm is in Chapter 11. And the bankruptcy section that permits that is section or authorizes that is Section 363. 363 provides that the bankruptcy court can approve a sale of part or all of a firm after notice and the hearing. Um, but that is all the statute says. That is what the hearing is supposed to be about, what standards are supposed to guide the sale, um, uh, when sales would be proper and improper. All of that is just made up by judges as they go along. Um, and uh, so, uh, and, and it turns out that um, although the numbers are a little unclear, maybe 30% or more firms are sold out of um, uh, chapter 11 under section 363. Uh, so why is that um, um, could be why could that be a concern? Well, if the government is going to bail out firms, the government is going to have some interest um, in what happens in the bankruptcy. So I just want to rehearse briefly what went on in the Chrysler bankruptcy and the GM bankruptcy. Um, what happened in those bankruptcies was that the firm that say Chrysler would file for Chapter 11 and then arrange a Section 363 sale. Um, but the 363 sale had a lot of conditions on it. And what were the conditions? The conditions essentially was any buyer had to take the union, uh, that is the auto workers, um, and had to, be, um, had to consent to pay the trade creditors and had a several other conditions that essentially produced no cash bids for Chrysler or General Motors, even though their assets had a lot of positive value. Um, uh, so the so the firms essentially were sold to the unions, and in Chrysler's case, a lot of it went to Fiat, who put up no cash whatsoever. Now, if you would say, well, how could this possibly happen? Because the the courts these these would be precedents for bailouts today, such as the bailouts of the airline industry. Um, and the reason it could happen is because Section 363, which was passed in 1978. Um, in anticipation that inventory would be sold out of bankruptcy and in no anticipation that firms could be sold out of bankruptcy has no standards whatsoever. So the courts in, in 2008 and 2009 that approved bailouts under these kinds of conditions essentially were free to do so de jure because there was nothing in the statutes that prevented them from doing it. So, hey, Alan, hey, Alan yeah. you, you underestimated how much you had to say because you've already filled up your 15, but those are fantastic points, but maybe you could um, wrap up. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I would just wrap, just would say, I would say one more th thing about consumers. Um, uh, under consumer bankruptcy now, uh, there is a means test for Chapter 7, and if you have a, above a certain amount of income, you have to file for Chapter 13, which essentially means that a large amount of your income has to be paid to creditors. Um, the people who were in Chapter 13 were a very small percentage because they were well-to-do people. But if you're going to get more and more well-to-do people filing for bankruptcy today, you're going to get a lot more Chapter 13s, which essentially means that we are going to be leaning the assets of, um, of high-income people, which is going to reduce their incentive post-bankruptcy to work. And this works at complete cost purposes with most executive compensation um, uh, contracts, which essentially want to create incentives to work. And that could have also a negative uh, macro effect. Great, thank you very much. Um, that was a very rich uh, uh, set of 15 minute presentations and we have two commenters. Uh, Adi, are you there to, to start us? Um, want to hit your mute, unmute. Here we go. Thank you. All right. Um, so thanks for this very, very interesting set of comments and discussions. Um, I should preface this by saying that I am not an expert on bankruptcy, um, but I've obviously many people have gotten interested in this in, in the last few weeks, and so have I. Uh, and so I thought I'd just talk about how um, I think about the goals and trade-offs in policy here. Um, and that's my background is more in thinking about sort of macro prudential policy as it related to banks in the previous crisis uh, and kind of macro finance. So I kind of see the, the there's two main goals of policy and one main constraint. 
um, or you could think of it as three goals. One goal is a microeconomic constraint, which is that we need to keep firms that we actually think are solvent but are facing liquidity problems alive. Uh, there's a macroeconomic um, policy goal that I think is very challenging that we're really trying to struggle with, which is that we need to try to minimize um, amplification of firm distress. And there's many parts to this. So one part, which Mark Rowe talked about was, you know, we need to preserve the balance sheets of solvent firms. Um, if we can emerge from the public health uh, crisis without huge debt overhang problems, that will be helpful. A second part, which um, Ed Morrison and David Skill talked about is that, you know, um, we need to reorganize insolvent firms as efficiently as possible. Um, there are many con constraints and considerations that go into that. You know, Ben Iverson talked about avoiding congestion in bankruptcy courts. Uh, Alan Schwartz just talked about trying to minimize kind of fire sales and the associated spillovers to other firms. Um, but this, this whole macroeconomic uh, policy goal is to, you know, it's somewhat different. You could put many firms in the economy into bankruptcy one at a time, and that would be okay. Trying to do them all at the same time, even if the bankruptcy system works relatively well, uh, is likely to result in much larger uh, total economic losses for society. And so trying to figure out how to manage that amplification is important. Set against those two goals, I think, is the, the goal of, you know, people will call it protecting the cat taxpayer and the government balance sheet, or simultaneously, you know, trying to actually impose as many losses as possible on um, firm debt and equity. And so what are the problems in implementing these goals? One problem is that uh, they conflict. So, um, you know, even if we knew exactly which firms are solvent and exactly which firms weren't, given the scale of the shock, uh, it seems unlikely to me that we could fully impose losses on debt and equity uh, without generating pretty large vicious cycles for the macro economy. Of course, the, the other big problem is that we don't actually know which firms are, which firms are solvent, which are not, um, which, what problems are liquidity problems, what problems are solvency problems, uh, and who is fine, in part because we don't know how long the, the public health emergency is going to last. So one thing that struck me in some discussions that people have had is that, you know, everybody's kind of anchoring on restaurants or cruise ships as the example where, you know, there's going to have to be fundamental restructuring, both financial and kind of real um, for those industries. But there's many, many other firms that are kind of in a middle ground where, you know, if this lasts three to six months, it's really a liquidity problem that they could survive. If it lasts much longer, then of course, it's going to be a solvency problem. And moreover, you know, if you think about it, the kind of micro problems and macro problems interact in the sense holding fixed the severity of the public health crisis, which is that, you know, which firms are solvent depart depends in part on how well we manage the fallout from directly affected non uh, non viable insolvent firms. So my basic view is that um, we're not sure. And so we should be trying to keep any firms where we're not sure alive because this reduces kind of the macroeconomic amplification in the short run. At some level, I think the government has an option. You know, um, it's a costly option of keeping firms alive, but um, it always has the option of letting those firms go bankrupt in the future. And so I think this, this option is really valuable uh, because of the spillovers I want to worry about uh, in bankruptcy. So that kind of informs how I think about what the Fed and the Treasury are doing. And I think there's some confusion because the Fed is doing multiple things at once. It's serving its true lender of last resort role uh, in, for instance, trying to stabilize the investment grade bond market. So by stabilizing that market, you know, it has announced that we'll buy a lot of stuff. So far, it hasn't really bought any. Uh, but by just announcing that, it has reopened the market firms have re, have avoided debt rollover problems um, and uh, a bunch of firms have in fact refinanced in the last three weeks. Um, secondly, it's serving as an agent of the Treasury Department uh, in these Main Street lending facilities for smaller and lower rated firms. And there I think, you know, I mean, it's blurring the line, but there that is really fiscal policy as Luigi Zingal has talked about. Um, you know, we have to decide whether we want to try to save those firms. Um, and there really is an important trade-off, I think, between targeting and take-up. If we don't target, we're wasting government money. Um, if we do target, um, 
we might just not hit enough firms to to hit our macro stabilization efforts. So that's kind of how I think about the, the broad uh, lay of the land. And um, it's been super informative uh, hearing from all of you. So I'll, I think I'll turn it over to Kristen Mugford at this point. Great, thank you, Kristen. You're still on mute. Let me see if I can unmute you. There you go, you're unmuted now. Oh, no, you're muted Good. again. <laughs> We're both trying to do it at the same time. Great, so um, so thank you. This has just been super informative and really um, a treat for me. Um, I just had four kind of points that I wanted to make off of the conversation. The first is I wanna echo um, this whole conversation around dip financing. And so I come from actually an investor background um, and this whole concept, whether it's dip financing in bankruptcy or rescue financing outside of bankruptcy, like rule one is that, you know, when a company is sick, you wanna be bringing in capital at the top of the capital structure that's effectively first in line. and. And this is a really rational process. And what's so striking, as many of you have said, not only is there a prohibition for it in bankruptcy, but, but if you look at the CARES Act and you look at how things are set up, there's still not this concept that exists out in the normal capital markets of what you do for sick companies is you put money in kind of first in line. And the, the thesis is that this is very rational lending. The idea is, is that you know a business's going concern value is greater than its liquidation value. If that's true, then capital that goes in helps the company be alive and that gives a better return to creditors even if it means or all stakeholders even if it means that we go through a restructuring as opposed to a liquidation and that concept isn't happening here so um, I agree Luigi with a lot of things you said about the CARES Act the other thing that's striking is when you look at the at least the term sheets on the main street um, lending provisions, which are huge, um, there all the money is coming in peri passu with existing lenders. So that's sort of issue one is there's not this concept of first in line. And that I think creates a whole bunch of adverse selection problems when you're asking banks to have the opportunity to put another loan next to them. The second issue is, is that nothing in here is really taking account of the pools of money that are, are the, the companies that are not being financed right now by the banking sector. And there there's two big examples. One is CLOs, so companies that are borrowing um, from, from institutional lenders in these syndicated loans that are held in these securitized CLOs, those vehicles can't do rescue financing. Similarly, we've seen this huge rise in direct lending as direct lenders and business development corporations have intermediated traditional banks. And so none of those structures are necessarily as set up for rescue lending. Maybe direct lending is, it's a new kind of less tested model. And so I'm again concerned that we don't have this capital kind of coming in not only during bankruptcy, but importantly, to help rationally provide capital to keep companies viable and solvent. Um, the second sort of point I would make, second and two and three are both kind of under the same umbrella, gets to this concept of, of how the bankruptcy code works. And one thing I always like to think about with bankruptcy is how much this is, the analogies of the healthcare sector really play in here, that we're talking about how to treat sick companies. And what's so striking to me is, is that in chapter 11, we kind of have this one set of rules to treat companies with a variety of illnesses. And I think that one thing that's happened clearly with the Small Business Reorganization Act is that that's at least now recognized that that set of companies need a different set of rules. One thing we're all talking about here is, is that in most of these cases, what we have are companies that are good businesses that are just over levered. They need a simple financial restructuring, not the full portfolio of tools that come in a traditional business restructuring of chapter 11. And so um, I know we're using prepacks as the way around it. I'm just curious if there's a better structure, whether it's borrowing from schemes of arrangement in the UK or there's been talk around chapter 13, 16, like is there some structure there? Um, a similar issue occurs, this is point number three, around um, how we think about the clogging in our courts. Again, in our healthcare system, we don't ask doctors to treat patients with all illnesses. There is some sort of triage that says that some set of doctors kind of take care of patients that have, let's say, simpler cases, and then we have other doctors who are taking care of the patients that need really more complicated treatment. And I sort of wonder if there isn't some model here to, to do a little bit of bankruptcy triage 
arbitrage and enable our seasoned existing bankruptcy judges to handle the more complicated cases and think about bringing in surge capacity or, or somehow um, bringing in troops to reinforce some of the simpler cases. And then the last point is, is um, I would just observe, we haven't talked so much yet about international. And, and you know, yes, I agree with so many of the commentators here that, that the US bankruptcy system has some benefits and it also has some faults, but certainly I worry a lot when I look internationally as to the, ski, the, the, um, the international structures, the legal structures that exist to contemplate how we're gonna restructure companies. We're blessed here in that we have a real concept of reorganization in lots of other countries they don't have the concept of rehabilitation. It's much more about liquidation. Um, there isn't a concept of dip financing, which yes, has its limitations, Alan, I agree, but at least is a way to kind of keep companies going to rehabilitate them. Um, we're already seeing places like Germany, the UK and Australia changing their rules around director, rule, director obligations when a company is insolvent. Um, but I just sort of worry even more about the fact that a lot of other countries don't have the same well-established tools that we have to be able to manage companies um, through this process. So those are my thoughts. Terrific, thank you very much. Um, we have a few minutes. Uh, uh, we actually ended on time, that's um, strange. Uh, so we have, I think, until the bottom of the hour. So if people have, maybe let me invite initially since there are no questions showing up at least my, my Zoom thing, if there are panel comp quick, let's make them quick comments by panelists about other panelists who maybe came later um, or any of the discussants. Um, does anybody who spoke want to speak up? I'm looking at- I'll, I'll add a few, a few things, not specifically to any, uh, this is Mark Rowe. You hear me? Yes, you hear me, okay. So I'm not specifically responding to any any particular person, but just some things to keep in keep in mind. Um, we probably want to be careful about nirvana fallacies. In that, um, there are some problems with the bankruptcy code. There are some pluses with the bankruptcy code. We'd like to fix the minuses. Let's get a different mechanism in place. Um, there's a pretty good chance that if we try to push together a mechanism um, in six, nine months that substantially displaces, that it could be captured by people with good lobbying skills in Washington. Um, it could not work quite as well as, uh, could work even, uh, even, uh, even worse in some ways. Um, and it, uh, that's one, one, uh, one aspect. Um, two, prepacks came up a, a few times. Um, Prepacks might be an example of the kind of thing that Alan Schwartz was pointing to of things in the financial markets where there's a, a disconnect between the bankruptcy code and the way financial markets could or should work. A significant portion of the prepacks are designed to bind holdouts in a recapitalization that frequently could have been done outside of bankruptcy where uh, a filing wasn't needed, a judge wasn't needed, most of the players were willing to go along with the deal, um, but they had a file to bind everybody. If votes were more readily available as opposed to being bought for bondholders outside of bankruptcy, um, we probably um, probably wouldn't need the, uh, the bankruptcy. Um, the third issue that Kristen, uh, Kristen raised about specialization, um, I think this um, interacts significantly with Ben's presentation about courts being clogged. Um, we have significant specialization in the United States. A significant number of the large firm bankruptcies are done as the bankruptcy panel knows, but maybe not everybody in the audience knows, in uh, the bankruptcy courts in Delaware and the Southern District of New York. And there are six, eight, 10 judges who have a lot of experience in dealing with public companies. And a significant number of the other 340 judges in the United States have limited experience in dealing with public companies. So uh, we have this specializ specialization and we have this problem in that if Delaware and the Southern District get overrun, that's gonna have a particular impact on the capacity to deal with large public companies. Um, and that's one of the problems that I think um, uh, emanates from the, uh, from the analysis that, uh, that Ben did. That's it. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, we did get one question uh, to Luigi. Are you still on? There's a question of whether the German model of short time work 
where the government subsidizes wages directly so companies don't lay off employees um, would be a good model generally. I don't know if you're still on. Um, I think we may have lost Luigi. Let's see here. Yeah, I think he may be gone. Um, okay, so. Ed, do you want to uh, jump in? Yeah, okay. more so needed. yeah I think the, the three takeaways that I take from this is that I think there's no doubt that the bankruptcy system is going to be used very heavily in the weeks going forward. Um, news reports today are that some of the fund, some of the, the treasury programs are already depleted in their funding. And so maybe we'll see more funding going ahead, but I think that for many businesses, the funding uh, will be insufficient, come too late, or um, not last long enough. And so I think we need to be prepared. So I think that, you know, Nirvana fallacies are always a problem we must be aware of, but I think there's no doubt that capacity of our system has to be addressed and flexibility in designing things such as what David Skill mentioned, like um, sort of, cookie cutter um, ways of steering firms or people through the process very quickly. The second is, is that um, I think that the federal financial aid going forward from the government needs to recognize the importance of bankruptcy that in this, in just the empirical importance, just that it's going to be used. And for many businesses that enter, there's gonna be a lack of financing or there's gonna be a need for financing that only maybe the government can provide. And so, the government should, I think, rethink programs that forbid financing to firms in the bankruptcy process. You can go, for example, to the Small Business Administration and look at the loan application for the PPP, and one of the check boxes is, how, are you in bankruptcy? If so, tough luck, you're not getting any aid. The third thing is I think the government needs to recognize it as options in extending financing. I agree with Adi that, that when in doubt, we should be funding, keeping businesses alive now, and deciding capital structure problems, operational problems later after the crisis ends. But if we see right now that there are some institutions that are deeply troubled and that all we're doing by financing them is kicking the can down the road, those are the firms where a strategic bankruptcy filing could make a lot of sense. I think the General Motors Chrysler examples are good templates for a 30-day bankruptcy that takes a firm in and out, keeps it alive, and keep in mind, the General Motors bankruptcy was precisely designed to prevent the reverberation or what it was called the amplification of distress. That it was thought that General Motors suffered distress outside of bankruptcy, members of the supply chain could suffer. Bringing the firm into bankruptcy stabilized the business, forced old investors to bear some losses, but kept the firm alive and prevented this amplification. So I think my takeaway, and I want to get across, is I think bankruptcy is a creative device, and I think it should be taken much more seriously than it has been to date by policymakers. Great, thanks. One challenge is in English, bankruptcy sounds bad, whereas you're arguing it's good, but that's, and that's a general political problem. Um, John Macy, I had your hand up. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, John. Um, I just wanted to sort of a little bit join um, uh, people, Mark Rowe particularly, in throwing a bit of cold water under the uh, rubric of the Nirvana fallacy about this idea of entering bankruptcy. I don't disagree with any of the points that have been made uh, by my colleague Alan or, or Ed or others about a uh, huge firm bankruptcy like a General Motors, but um, kind of channeling uh, Lynn Lopucky from UCLA and a number of other scholars uh, who have written about the incredible uh, waste and inefficiency uh, in uh, the bankruptcy process and, and, and particularly uh, in the form of um, uh, fees that are rather like a fixed cost so that we've really made bankruptcy, I would suggest, and you guys are all more expert than I am, so please correct me, uh, virtually untenable for a medium size or smaller public company. Uh, so if we look at the kind of a distribution of firms on the New York Stock Exchange, for example, or even more so on NASDAQ, uh, public companies, but you know, how much is a Delaware or New York bankruptcy really, how many of them are, are really available to survive the, the, the fixed cost associated with a New York or Delaware bankruptcy? Maybe I'm 
I, I, I just wonder. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, uh, I, I'm getting another request from Ed. Go ahead, Ed. Oh, just quick, John, I, I think that my sense among scholars is that everybody agrees that for small companies, bankruptcy makes no sense as a frontline attack, that it, other policies are needed for consumers too. For medium businesses, I guess where you, I'm not sure where your cutoff is, but I think there's probably a similar sentiment that really bankruptcy is only a useful tool when we're talking about very large corporations for precisely the reasons you give. Great. Is there anybody who wants to dissent from that or can we make that our major takeaway here? Because it echoes many things that Kristen, that uh, Ben from the beginning made, that Mark's worried about, that if we could find ways to triage um, from a policy perspective, what the system has to handle then obviously reduces the risk of clogging the macro effects. Mark's worried about, it means it's gonna be more tailored. And is there a way to do something in the near term that you know, I, I, I'm going to sound Boy Scoutish about saying this, but something even bipartisan that one could possibly imagine in the current environment. But thank you all. We're at time. And uh, I want to let everybody go because that's my main job. So thank you very much for this uh, delightful panel and, and to Mark in particular for getting uh, everybody to participate and to ECGI for, for organizing it. Thank you. <laughs>